This video was sponsored by Brilliant. This here is a complex function. It doesn't look like anything special and it's really not. When we have functions of x, we assume only real numbers go in and in turn real numbers come out. One goes in, one comes out. Two goes in, four comes out, and so on to get a parabola. When we use z, that's usually an indication that we can now plug in a complex number, one with a real and imaginary component. Like if we plug in 1 plus 2i and go through the math, out comes negative 3 plus 4i. This doubles the dimensions of our problem, because now just the input needs two dimensions, a real and imaginary axis, so we can represent something like 1 plus 2i. But we also need two dimensions for the output, which will also be complex, or negative 3 plus 4i in this case. If we plug in something simple like 2, then out comes 4, both of which lie on the real number line. Now we can represent any input and output pairs, but if you haven't learned much about complex numbers, then when given an input, it can seem kind of random as to what the output will be. Like how can we visually see that 1 plus i maps to 2i besides just foiling? Well, there's two ways to more intuitively understand the mechanics of complex numbers, which then leads to some interesting applications. The first thing we'll analyze is the real and imaginary components. For our function z squared, instead of inputting a specific number, let's put in an arbitrary x plus i y to represent any general input. After some foiling, we get out x squared minus y squared, the real part, plus 2xyi, the imaginary part. This isn't anything exciting yet. I mean, if we plug in 1 plus 2i, then 1 goes in for x and 2 for y, which leads to negative 3 plus 4i just as before. But now it's easy to see some interesting properties. One example is that the real component of our output will be 0 whenever x squared equals y squared. I'll move these aside so we can see the plot of x squared equals y squared in blue. And I'm using Desmos for the rest of this video and can't relabel the y-axis, but just assume that is the imaginary axis from here on. So what this equation tells us is that if I input any point on these lines, the function z squared will map it to the imaginary axis where the real component is 0. 1 plus i is an example of a point on those blue lines, and like we saw, 1 plus i squared is 2i, right on the corresponding output line. Then from this imaginary component, it's easy to see that it will be 0 if x and or y equals 0. So let me show those equations, or really the two axes in blue, because now we know any inputs on those lines will output something on the real axis where there's no imaginary component. The easiest example of this is the fact that i squared is negative 1. But now let's get to magnitude and phase, where things get much more intuitive. Any complex number, instead of being thought of as a real and imaginary component, can be represented by its magnitude, or distance from the origin, and the angle from the positive x-axis. This is mathematically represented with Euler's formula, where we have that magnitude e to the i times that angle. This is equivalent to a cosine theta plus i a sine theta, where the first expression is the real component, and the second with the i is the imaginary. I'm not going to show the proof in this video, but I'll provide links below. The reason this is so useful is because of what happens when we plug it into our function z squared. If we replace z with an arbitrary a e to the i theta, and we square that, we get a new complex number with the same amplitude squared and twice the input angle. I'll put numbers on the axes so we can see that this point here is 1 plus i, which can also be written as root 2, its magnitude, times e to the pi over 4i. So what is 1 plus i squared? Well, it's the same as this other expression squared, where we get a new complex number with a magnitude of root 2 squared, or 2, and a phase of pi over 2, twice the previous angle. To see this visually, I'll just square the magnitude and double the phase, which gets us to 2i, or 2e, to the i times pi over 2. And now you can visually find the square of any complex number. To find i squared, we take that point i and square the magnitude, which does nothing since it's 1, then double the phase to 180 degrees, which tells us i squared is negative 1. For any points that lie on these lines, x squared equals y squared, once we square the distance from the origin and double the phase, they all land on the imaginary axis like we saw. And here are just a bunch of other complex points where I'll square the amplitude and double the phase so you can see the transformations. 
Let's just rewind real quick though and know what happens to points on or inside the unit circle, which I'll put in a different color. These all have a magnitude of one or less. Therefore, when I square them, the magnitudes get smaller or stay the same. I'll apply the rotation again as well, but notice that the orange points remain in or on the unit circle while everything else gets further away. This will always be the case for z squared. In fact, let's apply that function again to all of these points. I'll square the magnitudes and double the phase where all the orange points are still within the circle or on it. If we were to keep going and just kept applying z squared, it's obvious that points outside the circle will go to infinity. I mean, we can't even see most of them anymore. But points within will tend to zero while points on the circle stay on it. Now, let me undo all of that again so we can highlight the fact that the unit circle is known as the Julia set of z squared. These are all the points where if we iterate the function, the output does not go to infinity. As in if we pick a random number, square it, then take the output and square that, then do that again over and over, if that number does not go to infinity, it is in the Julia set like we see here. I'm going to come back to this later, but I did want to mention it here. Now for many algebra or even pre-cal classes, something like this is pretty much the hardest kind of complex number math you have to do, which does make it hard to gain an appreciation for what you're learning. But this is simply one over a complex number, and for simple functions like this, there's nice visualizations. In school, you're required to rationalize the denominator, which involves multiplying by the complex conjugate, foiling the terms, and in this case it simplifies to 0.4 minus 0.2i. But any complex number can be written as ae to the i theta. And doing 1 over that gives us a new complex number with a magnitude that is 1 over the input magnitude, and the same phase as the input, but negative. If we put 2 plus i on our graph, the magnitude is root 5, so to find 1 over 2 plus i, we take the reciprocal of that magnitude, and then change the phase from roughly 26.6 degrees to negative 26.6 degrees, which lands us at 0.4 minus 0.2i. So finding the reciprocal of any complex number involves just inverting the magnitude and flipping the sign on the face. Let's see what that looks like when we do it to a bunch of complex numbers all at once, just cause, come on, it looks cool. I'll keep 2 plus i in a different color so you can at least track that, and you'll notice that anything inside the unit circle with a magnitude less than 1 will leave the circle, and everything outside will move into it when we apply that reciprocal magnitude. Then it's tough to track individual points from here, but if I change the phase of each point to its negative value, we get out the reciprocal of all those initial inputs. And we see that the orange dot is still mapped to 0.4 minus 0.2i. On an algebra test, you probably wouldn't be able to use this method, but at least give some visual intuition as to what you're doing. And with that, now let's get to my favorite part of this video. We've seen what happens to a bunch of complex points when we square them. But what happens if we instead apply the function z squared minus 1? Well, if you have some arbitrary complex number and subtract 1, all that happens is the real component decreases by 1. And on the graph, this corresponds to sliding the point left by 1. So this function overall is easy to work with. We just apply z squared like before, and then shift everything to the left by 1. Let's just see what that looks like with a bunch of complex points where we'll again square the magnitudes, double the phases, and also slide one to the left. Nothing too special yet. Going back real quick, here's the tough question though. What is the Julia set of this function z squared minus one? As in if we keep applying the function over and over, which points will not go to infinity? Before it was anything within the unit circle, inclusive, because anything inside it moved closer to the origin. But now with the sliding, the answer is actually much more complicated. Before I show the Julia set, I'll just say that of the points I have here, these orange ones are the only ones that won't diverge to infinity and thus are in the set. If we apply z squared minus 1, then do that again, and continue to do so, those orange points will always stay on the screen, while everything else will start to go to infinity. So what region contains all the points that won't diverge? It's not a weird polygon or a conic section, but it's a fractal. Any points within this region will not diverge to infinity, which makes this the Julia set of z squared minus 1. 
I had to write a quick program to figure this out, but I looked for the boundary around this area and found that negative one plus 0.244i is within the Julia set, but negative one plus 0.245i is not. And you'll see after one iteration of running them through z squared minus one, the outputs are about the same. But after iterating z squared minus one over and over, the numbers on the left enter a cycle going from negative one to zero and back, while the numbers on the right diverge. I also found an online Julia set generator, which will show the set for z squared plus any complex value based on where your mouse is. Right now it's at negative one, so this is the set for z squared minus one, which we knew. And now my mouse is at the origin, which shows that the Julia set for z squared is the unit circle, which we also saw earlier. As I move the mouse around though, and we change that complex constant, we can see how the associated Julia set changes. What I find even cooler than this is what makes the Julia set connected. See how here we don't have a connected set, while here we do, that dark region? Well, it turns out the Julia set is connected if and only if that complex constant, or my mouse location, is within the Mandelbrot set, another fractal. While the complex constant, or my mouse, which you can't see right now, is within that set, we have a connected Julia set. But once it leaves, like we see here, that set becomes disconnected. There are infinitely many Julia sets, but there's only one Mandelbrot set. To know whether something's in the Mandelbrot set, like negative 0.5 plus 0.1i is, just take the function z squared plus that number, plug in z equals zero, then iterate the function over and over like before. If the outputs don't diverge to infinity, then it is in the Mandelbrot set. And the beauty within these is literally endless because as you zoom in, you keep finding new shapes and patterns. And we can see that fractal nature as we come across more mini Mandelbrot sets. But there are videos here on YouTube over an hour long that give incredible detail to what it looks like as you magnify these fractals. Whether it's the Mandelbrot or a Julia set, note that the colors are not part of those sets. The colored points do diverge. But how many iterations it takes before that point diverges, or really gets past a certain threshold, determines how that point is colored, which obviously leads to some really cool images. A lot of what we've seen so far, not so much with the fractals, but the complex plane animations, is going to lead us to some applications, but that's going to be the focus of next video. If you want to learn more about the mathematics seen in this video though, you can check out Brilliant's Complex Numbers course. This covers everything discussed here, plus plenty more, and also provides animations and interactive exercises to give you a real understanding of the mechanics of complex numbers. Even if you're a beginner, this course is perfect because it starts at the basics, while still giving you an appreciation for why complex numbers are so important. But by the end, you'll get into more advanced concepts as well as applications that'll piece everything together. The fact that they have constant practice problems combined with visual explanations for every course is why I really like this site, and yeah, even though they sponsor the videos, I honestly do learn a lot from them and frequently put that information in these videos. If you want to get started right now and support the channel, you can click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash majorprep to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. As always, huge thanks to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links are down below and I'll see you guys in the next video.